Strong earnings and a strong economy make Jack a fun boy. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. But you're Romain, you're not Jack. Just I want to be clear. I don't know. It depends on the day. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, I'm Alex Steele. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Record high, record high, record high. That's what we see in the NASDAQ 100. It's what we see in the S&P. It's what we see in New York Fang. Uh, what I basically hear is earnings crush it, jobs crush it, and that really being reflected in the equity market. What's so interesting, if you take a look at the two-year, though, that's up by 16 basis points, yet stocks holding on to their lead. However, if you take out Amazon, you take out Meta, you take out NVIDIA uh, from the S&P, you're taking out 44 points. I'm just pointing that out. It's still big tech somewhat leading the way here, Romain. All right. Well, you know, Alex, I'm going to put those back in here because, of course, that is really the story of the day. And before we go any further, I really want all the viewers out there, just bow your heads and give a golf clap right now for Mark Zuckerberg and Andy Jassy <laughs> for really salvaging this earnings season that just a few days ago, remember, looked like tired and weak. Meta Platforms and Amazon, they spent most of 2023 cutting costs and refocusing their businesses, much to the chagrin of a lot of investors. But those benefits of those efforts really apparent in the earnings reports we got out of them last night. Invest Investors really tickled pink, sending Amazon shares to the highest since late 2021. Meta right now is at a record high. And remember, it was just a couple of weeks ago that Meta earned that dubious distinction of posting the single biggest loss of market value in history. That was after an earnings report. Today is Redemption Day. Meta poised to set the single biggest increase in market capitalization, eclipsing the $191 billion market cap gain made by Apple back in 2022. Now, we should note Meta and Amazon today, as Alex was pointing out, combined are responsible for about 80 percent of the point gains in the S&P and the Nasdaq 100. Now, the only thing eclipsing this massive rally in stocks today is that massive sell off in treasuries. Two year treasury prices plunging yields up the most going back to March of 2023. A crazy end to a wild week that started with high conviction for a Fed rate cut next month and ends today with little chance of that happening. What, after Jay Powell's press conference Wednesday and that blowout jobs report today, Alex, a jobs report that showed a surge in hiring and a surge in the amount of money those employers are having to pay those employees. I know, but we're still looking at, you know, five to six cuts so yeah. far this year. I mean, and one plus one is not equaling two right now in yeah. my mind. So check this out. So there's a lot of great things to get out of that job report, but this was the one head scratcher to me. So uh, the white line here is the non-farm payroll. We know did really well, over 330,000 jobs added. Now, the orange line is the hours adjusted non-farm payroll because you had the hours work shrunk despite the fact that wages actually grew. Now, if you do the NFP in relation to those uh, hours worked, you actually saw a decline of over uh, 400. 80,000 jobs. So what does that mean? Is that like a one-off? Does that mean that demand's really not there, but we're not seeing the workers necessarily laid off? Or was this just an anomaly? Forget it. Look at the headline number, Romain. Yeah, I mean, that is really the big question. And now the setup heading into the next uh, few weeks and months, quite frankly, has really changed a lot from where it was just about a week ago. Tom Purcelli joining us right now, chief U.S. economist at PGM Fixed Income. Tom, what did you make of that labor market report this morning? Uh, yeah, so good to be with you, and I, I love the setup um, le leading in here. Uh, look, I think I think my pr my primary takeaway is whatever you thought about the economy at eight twenty nine, I, I don't know that you were really supposed to adjust it all that much at eight thirty. I mean, <laughs> short, you know, short of people that were expecting a recession imminently, um, or anyone who was looking for a cut in March, um, I think two pools of people that were pretty small anyway. Um, I don't know that much has changed because I think Alex really hit on a, an incredibly important point. You know, I think about, I, look, I can tell you that, um, yeah, you know, there were some seasonal issues, um, your response, response rates were low. I mean, we could talk about all that. But, mm -hmm. but here's the, here, like, if you want to boil it down to, like, the simple reality, whatever the run rate on jobs was or should have been, the reality is wages were disappointing. Right, wages looked at properly were disappointing, and mm -hmm. wages looked at properly is not average hourly earnings. It's an incomplete measure of wage dynamics. The thing you want to look at is average weekly earnings, and average week, which incorporates average hourly earnings plus hours. Um, and when you look at that, um, it was actually down um, month on month. So um, uh, you know, to me, that's that that's the key. Uh, it, it, whether the number should have been two hundred thousand or it actually was three hundred and fifty-three thousand. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think it matters. I think yeah. ultimately, what matters is 
um, wages continue to sort of soften here. So, um, and for us, and again, maybe it's easier for me to say all this because we, we, we continue to sit in the soft landing camp. Right. We did not think that the Fed was going to raise rates in March. Um, and for us, you know, nothing has to change as it relates to our calls. Well, that, bring, that raises an interesting question, though, for the Fed. I mean, Jay Powell kind of came out on Wednesday, made it clear to the market he wasn't cutting in March. Yep. Though we should point out he made that clear even prior to Wednesday. But the mar- it seemed like the market just finally decided to actually listen to it. But it raises the question about what the debate is going to be uh, at that March meeting here. Is it really going to be about uh, some of the traditional inflation metrics, core PCE, or is it going to be much more about some of these wage numbers and, more importantly, just the overall health of the labor market? Yeah. So, look, I, I think the reality is this, um, you know, there's been some mixed signals from a, a labor market perspective. Um, you know, ADP um, earlier this week uh, obviously was not um, in line at all with uh, what we're seeing from this payroll reporting. Yeah, I'm not I'm not saying one. They're totally different samples. We all get that. I'm just simply saying um, that there there are labor market metrics um, that were not nearly as strong as as, as what we saw today. Um, so I think what the Fed is gonna um, is gonna have to sort of entertain is, you know, the the longer they sit on the sidelines and not cut, um, the more that inflation with inflation that continues to slow, which is what we expect will happen, um, then real Fed funds actually becomes even more restrictive. And I think that's what the conversation is going to be for them. So what we think about the easing cycle to come, and we, you know, we expect uh, there'll be three cuts this year. Um, when, when we think about that, we really think about this as sort of a, you know, an adjustment cycle, taking back all of the aggressive tightening that they put in place when they truly feared um, inflation. Mm-hmm. I think that that fear is fading. Um, I think, you know, Powell, again, he said all the right things about, uh, you know, they obviously still wanted to fall and et cetera. But I, I think there's, it sounds to me that there's some pretty clear recognition um, that inflation is, you know, clearly moving in the right direction. So, Tom, um, particularly if we're looking at it on a three or six month basis. So, I think it's 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 about that, Alex. Sorry, so, go ahead. So, Tom, it feels like what you're saying is it's a normalization of rates, not yeah. cutting because of a deep recession. But the market's still looking right. at five to six cuts. So, if the normalization part happens, we still need to reconcile right. sort of half the cuts. When does that happen, and how does that happen? So, it, it's a it's a great question, Alex. And so, what I would uh, the way I would answer it is this. I don't think the market is wrong in looking for six cuts. I think the market is wrong with the timing. I mean, I, I think that if we're right um, that 24, um, you know, winds up being this, this soft landing sort of scenario that plays out, um, if that continues to persist into 25, then the Fed will continue cutting rates. Um, so I think the market pricing it in, and they're probably doing it a little too soon. I just think it's going to be more drawn out. So, Tom, when we take a look at the market reaction, Appropriate. It feels like stocks are definitely moving uh, when it comes to earnings and you have the bond market moving on the actual data. So a good 15, 16, 18 basis points on the front end. Like, does this make sense for where you see the economy playing out then? Yeah, I, you know, I think what the market is, is probably grappling with today is the idea that, you know, we were just talking about this. Um, I, I said, you know, some of the people that are disappointed are people that were still clinging to a March cut. There were still people clinging to a March cut. I mean, there's still 25 percent chance of cut um, in March. And so I think what the market is trying to sort of, um, you know, they're, they're, they're in price discovery mode now. And I think the market recognizes that earlier cuts are, are getting pushed. All right, Tom, always great to talk to you. Tom Purcelli there, chief U.S. economist over at PGM Fixed Income. A look at that jobs report that we got earlier this morning, a jam-packed show here on this Friday afternoon with some news breaking just a few moments ago. This involving Morgan Stanley and Mike Wilson, of course, the top equity strategist over at that firm, said to be stepping down from his role as chair of the firm's global investment committee. Shanali Bassett joining us right now on our Wall Street Beat. Uh, Shanali, give us some more details. What exactly is happening here? So you do have him stepping out of a critical role here where he had been the CIO of the Wealth Management Unit. This is an interesting move, Romain. When we think about most people on Wall Street that we have commenting on the markets, really weighing in, they're mostly uh, analysts, right? They're mostly purely on the sell side. Something different about Mike Wilson is that he operated on the sell side and the buy side. And that was because Morgan Stanley structures this role as the CIO of Wealth Management in addition to um, just a broader role analyzing markets at large. He's leaving the Global Investment Committee, and he will focus on serving key institutional clients with a demand for generating tactical alphas intensifying according to an internal memo. And you have Lisa Shallot, 
who has been the CIO of Wealth Management, will assume those day-to-day -day duties as chair of the committee. So remember, this is Wilson, the top equity strategist for Morgan Stanley, now stepping down as the Global Investment mm -hmm. Committee chair. Lisa Shallot now stepping into that role. And, and just to point out, for all the equity people out there, he still will be the U.S. equity strategist for Morgan Stanley. So there still will be Mike Wilson on TV talking about U.S. equities. Shanali, we also got some news from the Wall Street Journal talking about some management committee changes over at Goldman Sachs. What do we know? So we know a few things. The people that will be stepping down from that committee include Allison Mack who is one of the most iconic investment bankers on Wall Street, very closely known to have banked the private equity industry in particular. And we also know that stepping down from this committee is also George Lee, who is a technology banking veteran at Goldman Sachs. Now, this is a, the management committee, right? It, it is a very uh, important committee to lead the firm and steward it. Steward the, the direction of the firm moving forward, According to the Wall Street Journal, David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman, and John Waldron, the president, they are in a month-long process to figure out how that membership of that management committee will change and who the contenders will be. There have, no been, uh, there have been no final decisions made yet, uh, a spokesman told the journal. But again, the people who will be stepping down have been longtime veterans of the firm and yeah. uh, critical members of their banking practices. All right, Shanali Basak here uh, with the breaking news. The Journal reporting uh, two departures from Goldman's uh, management committee, including Allison Mass and George Lee and Mike Wilson, who headed up uh, Morgan Stanley's uh, Global Investment Committee, also said to be stepping aside, though still remaining with the firm. A lot more coming up here on the big program, including a conversation with Ed Hyman, founder and chairman of Evercore ISI, his insights on the markets, the economy, and that job support and what it could signal for Fed policy. Plus, we're going to talk with the Chevron Chairman and CEO Mike Word, the company beating earnings forecasts, hikes its dividend, really delivers on all fronts. The stock up over 3%. And looking at another stock moving, Cigna. It is our stock of the hour. Shares up as the company posted better than expected results in the most recent quarter and lower medical costs. That conversation and so much more coming up in just a bit. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Shares of Chevron moving higher today, up by over 3%. you got the oil and gas giant reporting earnings at top estimates. Also announced a dividend bump that was higher than expected. You get rising oil output from shale fields, really helping cushion the blow from any weakening uh, crude prices. Let's bring in Mike Worth now, chairman and CEO of Chevron. Mike, it's always great to see you. Thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure to be with you. So, Mike, I, I promised Romaine that I do the nerdy stuff first. So, fair enough. Let's start with the Permian, because the growth rate in the Permian was truly uh, spectacular. Production overall was up 14%, uh, 14% growth in the Permian. That's incredible. And if you take a look at what your growth forecast is going to be over the next year, you're still looking at that 1 million barrels of oil a day for 2025. What is really driving that? Well, Alex, it's great execution. And it, it really starts uh, outside the Permian. It was a year of records for us. We had record global oil and gas production of 3.1 million barrels a day, record U.S. production. And in the fourth quarter, we had record Permian production of over 870,000 barrels per day. Uh, so really strong performance in, in our business across the board allowed us to return a record $26 billion to shareholders, almost 10 percent of our market cap. And as you mentioned, uh, we raised our dividend 8 percent mm -hmm. earlier this year. So uh, strong performance uh, you know, around the world. Permian certainly showing very strong growth and momentum as we move towards a million barrels a day in 2025. So, Mike, you mentioned on the call that you weren't going to be increasing CapEx. So I'm just wondering what your confidence level is in maintaining uh, and improving those productivity and efficiency gains. Well, capital discipline always matters in our business. And for years now, we have been uh, very uh, committed to a tight capital budget and focusing on execution. What we've done now in the Permian is we've grown to a point where uh, we'll uh, hold our CapEx as guided about $5 billion this year and, uh, and see continued growth this year and next year. And as we get uh, to next year at a million barrels a day, we'll start to talk about holding a plateau, which allows us to actually invest even less 
capital in order to do that. So uh, we're very committed to uh, you know capital discipline through the cycle. It matters in this industry. It's an industry that at times uh, hasn't necessarily exhibited that. And I think it's important that, that our company and other companies uh, remember the lessons of commodity markets. What does that mean, uh, Mike, going forward here once the acquisition of Hess uh, closes later, later this year here? What type of changes still need to be made? When we, we closed the deal with Hess, which is uh, expected mid-year, uh, we've got a, a fairly involved FTC uh, information request that we're in the midst of right now. Uh, we'll have a, a company that has even stronger uh, production growth further into the future. Uh, it will allow us to underpin uh, not only uh, the dividend, but also a very strong balance sheet and continued uh, share repurchases not only through the balance of this decade, but well into the next. So it takes what's a strong portfolio for us today, and it makes it even stronger for longer. And then, of course, looking at the strength in the stock, looking at the strength of the balance sheet, Mike, I'm sure you've heard the questions here. Do you plan any other major acquisitions this year? We, we just com completed one acquisition last year. We're in the midst of, of another one. And uh, we're always alert to opportunities, but integrating a company in our industry matters. Uh, we operate in uh, challenging environments. The work we do needs to be done with precision to keep people safe, to protect the environment. And integrating two companies together and all the, the things that go with that are uh, something we, we take very, very seriously. And so uh, we've, got our, uh, we've got our hands full right now. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll work hard to close the Hess deal and do a good job integrating a great company with ours. And uh, as we go forward, if opportunities present themselves, we'll certainly evaluate them. But we're not, we're not feeling a need to do anything. I was CEO speak for, nah, not right now. I got a lot going on. Fair enough. Um, hey, Mike, uh, we talked about um, the buyback and stuff and sort of uh, bought back about 5% of your stock last year. Do you guys have a target for what that's going to be this year? We're uh, right now under some SEC constraints because of the transactions, uh, but the last two quarters we've, we've bought back about $3.5 billion each quarter. Uh, once we're out from under those uh, constraints and, and uh, we have the, the Hess shareholder vote, we've indicated that we would step up to a $20 billion run rate uh, in a commodity environment like the one that we see today. Last year, uh, we repurchased just short of 15 billion dollars. And so that would be a significant step up. It would be a sign of confidence in the future, just as the 8 percent increase mm -hmm. in the dividend this week is a sign of confidence in the future. So that's that's the guidance we've uh, currently got out there in the marketplace. Mike, I'm interested when if we just take a step back for a second. The last 12 hours was about big oil delivering and it was also about big tech delivering and both now have dividends and both now have buybacks. How do you how does oil, big oil, Stay relevant in a market that is just obsessed with AI and big tech. Well, it's a very interesting market, and I know you were talking about this earlier. Uh, there are a handful of technology companies that uh, really have been driving uh, this market, and the valuations obviously have uh, gotten to levels that, that we've never seen before. Uh, we are a, 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 an essential industry to the global economy or an industry that's been around for a long time and will be around for a long time in the future. We have a track record of generating cash and returning that to shareholders. So our dividend yield is above 4%. Uh, we've increased our dividend for 37 consecutive years. Uh, our dividend yield is more than two and a half times the, the yield of the S&P. And our free cash flow yield is, uh, is almost three times the S&P at over 8%. And we've got a track record of, of returning that to shareholders. And yet, energy trades at about half the multiples of the market broadly, and even less than some of the companies that you're referring to. So there's a real value opportunity here yeah. for uh, long, patient shareholders uh, to secure income, to secure the future appreciation, and it's underpinned by the, uh, the strong cash flow, the strong balance sheet, and, uh, and the, the track record that a company like ours offers. What is, I guess, the corporate future of Chevron here? I mean, looking through uh, today's numbers, Mike, of course, we had that big write-down, the $3.7 billion, uh, stemming from a write-down of those California assets. And, of course, there's a much bigger story behind that with regards to the, regula the legislative changes that have already come down the pike and some additional regulatory changes that might also be coming. Is Chevron still wedded to California as its home base? Well, California has, uh, for the last couple of decades, 
pursued policies that are intended, and this has been a part of the plan, to uh, reduce demand for our products, which hasn't really happened. Demand remains very strong, but also to reduce investment in our industry. And these policies have made investment in California less attractive than investment in other places in the U.S. and other places around the world. And what it's likely to do is reduce production and reduce supply. Uh, and if, if, if we don't see a corresponding reduction in demand, that, that creates uh, you know, some risks for the marketplace. But policy choices do have uh, investment uh, consequences. They do influence investment decisions. And what we see playing out in California is exactly what, what the mm -hmm. state uh, has been seeking. Mike, do you want to move to Texas? <laughs> We've got a lot of uh, operations in Texas. We've got a lot of people in the great state of Texas. And uh, it's where a lot of the growth we've been talking about in the Permian Basin uh, has been occurring. So we, we've got a large presence there, and, and it's, a, uh, it's a growing presence. Fair, fair answer. Um, Mike, to that point, I just wanted to get your sense. There's so much to get through, too, but geopolitical risk. Where you sit, what's the biggest one? Is it California? Is it U.S. policy, a.k.a. a moratorium on LNG exports? Is it Venezuela? Uh, is it Gu Guyana and Venezuela and Guyana and that dynamic there? What keeps you up at night among all those? Well, our, our business brings with it geopolitical interactions and geopolitical risk. You've run through uh, a whole series of them that are, are part of our world. Uh, some are, are present in the short term. So the Middle East uh, presents risks each and every day to security of passage of uh, vessels, uh, the risk that we could see some sort of interruptions to flow. Uh, you get out into a, a medium term uh, time frame and uh, some of the policies in the U.S. where we've seen uh, mixed signals uh, from the administration. Uh, in some instances, encouragement to invest and grow, uh, particularly when prices were high. But in other cases, uh, cancellation of pipeline, cancellations of lease sales, uh, pausing on LNG export uh, processes, uh, which discourage investment. And so these mixed signals in the medium term uh, run the risk of creating some consequences. And then longer term, when policy stays consistent, as it has in California, and it starts to influence supply, when demand is unchanged, that creates a different set of issues. And so we deal with geopolitical risk in mm -hmm. every time frame and, frankly, all around the world every day. It's why, you, you know, you need a large portfolio, a strong balance sheet, yeah. a diverse set of opportunities uh, so that you can manage that risk uh, with uh, all the tools that we have. Mike, before I let you go, talking about risk, uh, you got Brent at 77, WTI at 72. Does that surprise you, considering all the risks you were just talking about? It's a market that is relatively balanced right now. We've got OPEC Plus uh, making some cuts. Demand has been strong. We saw demand go up a couple million barrels a day last year. Uh, global economy, certainly here in the U.S., with the jobs report and other indicators we're seeing, and demand in our industry is strong. China is, uh, is growing again, and uh, not maybe as strong as it was a few years ago, but China's growing. Uh, Europe, not so much. But global demand is going to increase uh, again this year. Uh, supply has been keeping up with that demand, but uh, the risks that we see in uh, the Middle East are, are very real, and they could move markets. One thing that's different is the U.S. is now the world's biggest producer. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to periods in the past where these kinds of risks really did get priced quickly into the market, it was because the U.S. was so dependent upon supplies from the Middle East and, and, and mm -hmm. other parts of the world were as well. Today, with the U.S. as the world's largest supplier, there is a, a different balance and a different uh, set of exposures uh, that I think the market is also, uh, you know, pricing in. Mike, always a pleasure. We thank you so much for the time. I know these are long days for you, Mike. We're the chairman and CEO of Chevron. Thank you very much. What I heard in that is that the reason why you're not seeing the price spike, because of Exxon and Chevron, yeah. all the amount of oil are now pumping from the Permian specifically. Yeah, and you wonder, though, when does sort of regulatory policy maybe potentially uh, catch up with that? We talk about California, but of course we know at least right now we have a federal administration uh, that I think, if I'm not speaking out of turn, wants to rein that in. Uh, Yes and no, right? Like they want low gasoline prices, yeah. but yet, and but but they want to mm. be able to say don't drill. So it, it is a little confusing talking out of like both sides on that, but it does increase that risk. Yeah, it is confusing. <laughs> we definitely agree. That's our takeaway. We definitely agree <laughs> on that. All right, coming up here, a closer look here at the market so far this year and what's ahead for the rest of 2024. Ed Hyman, chairman over at Evercore ISI, he's stopping by the big program right after the break. This is Bloomberg.
Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. So that week happened. Uh, Today yeah. happened. This was something. It was a crazy <laughs> week. I mean, you think about how we came into this week knowing it was going to be consequential. But I'm not sure it really panned out exactly the way that people have been priced for it between what Jay Powell had to say on Wednesday, the jobs report today, and then, of course, all those earnings, which was kind of conflicting, right? You had those big tech earnings on Tuesday that disappointed everybody and the big tech earnings on Thursday that pleased everybody. I mean, with Meta, like, that's not a biotech stock that's supposed to move 20 percent. It's a no. $1 trillion company moving 20 percent. This is yeah. some serious money changing hands here. Yeah, well, it's now $1 trillion and 25 percent more than that. And then, and then add on and add <laughs> and on and, then, and add on. And then of that. But it really gets to this. This idea here. Uh, I think of how this year is going to shake out. Is this really going to be about those big tech stocks or is this going to be more of a macro driven story? At least for today, that is a big part of the reason why you're seeing stocks higher, that blockbuster jobs report. But it's still raising a lot of questions out there about the timing of Federal Reserve rate cuts. We had a chance to catch up with the Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian for his take on the numbers. Wow. I mean, what, what, an, what an amazing jobs report. It just confirms that this is an exceptional labor market that's going to feed into the exceptionalism of the U.S. economy. I do think it's a bit of a headache for the Fed um, because of the wage growth numbers. Mohamed El Arian giving his knee-jerk reaction to that jobs report early today. Let's get some insights out of Ed Hyman, chairman of Evercore ISI. And Ed, you heard the wow out of him, basically an exceptional report and an exceptional economy. <laughs> I had a wow, too. Did you? Yeah. And Well, what did you make of it? I mean, not, not just in terms of the exceptionalism baked in it, but the idea that is this kind of the new normal? I mean, everybody is sort of expecting that big labor market slowdown, and we continue to get reports that defy that. So the point I would add, uh, Romain, is that we had a package of stronger news this week. It, was a, it wasn't just one report, but that was a wow report anyway. Uh, but it did, uh, employment increases have been clearly slowing from 500,000 to 400,000 to 3 to uh, 150,000. And then this popped it back up over 200,000. But unemployment claims, you know, another excellent uh, metric on the labor markets, they were still very strong uh, this week. Mm -hmm. And the Atlanta Fed has an estimate of GDP uh, that's widely followed for the first quarter, and that moved up to 4%. Uh, so it was, it was, a, it yeah. was an exceptionally strong week. So wow, wow, wow. Of course, I'm sure you know, Ed, everyone now is trying to focus in on how the Fed reacts to this. If you have an economy that is headed towards a lower inflation, which appears that we are, an economy that where the growth trend is now getting back, if not up to normal, maybe exceeding that, how do policymakers sort of, I guess, balance that all out here? You want a strong economy, but you want to make sure inflation doesn't come back. Um, they've paused. Yeah, as a fact, they've you know, not tightened for a while. And they've indicated they're going to stay on pause. And if the economy gets weaker, uh, or if inflation were to come down a lot, uh, then they could cut rates. Was one of the things this week I'd like to point out. Uh, every tightening cycle, uh, 1971 forward, there have been 13 tightening cycles. And every one of them has had a financial shock or crisis. Hmm. We had one earlier this last year, mm -hmm. you know, the SVB, Silicon Valley Bank. And then this week we had the New York Community Bank. And so those financial shocks uh, are part of a tightening cycle. Uh, so that is sort of a wake up call that uh, you're getting some early signs that the tightening is working. But in terms of everything that happened this week in the markets, uh, as you covered earlier, Alex, the, the price of oil is down. I think the $72 uh, today on WTI, uh, less uh, jaw-dropping for your viewers, uh, but the uh, problems in the Red Sea have pushed up container freight rates by 200%. And so this week, they dropped 4%. Uh, first time they've dropped in, in, in weeks. Uh, so the inflation news uh, was a while also. And that's a lot of why the market's been so positive. So, Ed, I mean, I'm listening to you and I'm feeling pretty cheery. Um, 
do I just go sit in tech? Like, do I take on a lot of risk? There's also a ton of money in money market funds, and I'm wondering where that winds up going if things keep improving like you mentioned. Well, it's Friday afternoon. <laughs> Be cheery. <laughs> the, okay. Uh, the, I think a recession's coming, uh, but I'm, I keep pushing it out. Right now, I have it pushed out to the third quarter of this year. Uh, and I think I'll know when it's here. It's not here now. You don't need a weatherman or me to tell you that, but it's not here now. And inflation coming down is here now. Uh, you had a, a wonderful employment cost index this week, mm -hmm. which overshadowed a little bit stronger average hourly earnings. So wages look like they're slowing. Commodity prices are coming down. Uh, rents are coming down. And so we have a, you know, a very positive backdrop, which is why the market keeps just moving up every week. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the weekend. I'm going to relax. So, so, Ed, does that mean that you're waiting for a recession, but the longer that it gets pushed out, the worse that, that it gets, or the more it's going to incentivize so. you to take risk because <laughs> you have to? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think necessarily the worse it, it's going to be in that sense. But uh, we've had uh, unprecedented monetary tightening with a big in increase in Fed funds plus QT. And the Fed's balance sheet dropped a lot this week, along with the uh, shock from the commercial bank, New York uh, Commercial Bank. And so you have that. You have the inverted yield curve. And bank deposits are already down year on year. Most they've dropped since the 1930s. And it won't show up in the numbers today, uh, but I'll be looking over the next yeah. few weeks to see if bank deposits come down. Ed, we have to get your thoughts on what's going on in China. The second largest economy isn't looking all that great these days. And while no one is certainly uh, talking about their demise, I am curious if and when you might see a rebound there. China's weak, and I'm going to wait until I see some really convincing uh, stimulus that's going to turn it up. But we have a lot of information on China. Word of mouth is not good. Uh, people I talk to who have been there, the mood is pretty somber. And bond yields made new lows this week in China. The stock market made new lows. These help explain why oil prices are so weak even though the Red Sea is still a mess. Uh, we survey companies, 21 companies, every week that have sales in China. And uh, on a zero to 100 basis, that survey this week was 32. Uh, the same survey for the states, yeah. US companies, was 49. Uh, anyway, so it's everything I looked at, uh, whether it's the market or surveys, yeah. what I hear from people, China's weak, and it, and it helps me understand uh, why inflation is coming down around the world. All right, Ed, uh, we have to leave it there. Always great to talk to you. Some great insights, as always. Really just a legend on Wall Street. Ed Hyman there. He is chairman of Evercore ISI. Of course, founded ISI way back when, and has been ranked, of course, as one of the top uh, economists and researchers, I don't know how many years running now, as something like three or four decades. Yeah. I just can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, I don't have to put money to work, so that's good. But yeah. I can't imagine how difficult this time is right now, yeah. particularly when you have a really active Fed, yeah. right? Like the reason why you didn't have SVB turn into a complete utter crisis is because you had the backstop, right? Yes. So you have liquidity backstop. Yeah. And then you can be absolutely right on the macro and be absolutely wrong on how to make money. Yeah. The, and how many times have we seen that? A lot. That's why I'm soup cans and gold under my bed. <laughs> you know you are too. Come on now. No, no, no. It's just silver. <laughs> All right, coming up here, the healthcare giant Cigna posting better than expected fourth quarter results. It's our stock of the hour, and it's up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back. Stocks overall are higher on the day in Cigna, one of the big movers, up about 5 percent. Best day in a month and a half. This after the company reported earnings and boosted its profit outlook. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now for our stock of the hour. It is Cigna. And 
Well, a 5% gain, nothing to sneeze at. What's behind it? Nothing to sneeze at at yeah. all, no pun intended, of yeah. course, because it is a healthcare company. But they put up much better yeah. uh, results than expected. Uh, their guidance was better. And behind this, really, the fact that they have two divisions, both of them uh, hitting it well. The health insurance was better than expected. And then they also have this PBM business that did really well. Uh, that was, of course, the Express Scripts acquisition. Now, we learned some additional co color relative to the PBM. Uh, they did sign this contract with uh, Centene that started on January. January 1st, so that was a good thing. They also, uh, there was thought that they were selling their Medicare business. We learned officially that's going to be sold out by the end of 2025. You know, so overall, a strong quarter. They didn't puke it out like Humana. It wasn't as bad as United. Uh, analysts like it. And, uh, you know, this quarter in particular gave analysts a reason to think that they could grow 10 to 13 percent over the long term. It's interesting. One analyst said that they made comments on M&A. And in light of Humana falling more than 11 percent, I think it was last week or the week before, it was the worst day in a number of years, that Humana maybe, the implication, her implication was that maybe Humana could be some sort of a target for them. Wow. So why did it do so much better? Because the idea is that medical costs were rising, therefore they had to reimburse more. That should be across the whole board, right? So yes, it should be. So in their Medicare business, though, they did much better. They beat uh, costs by about 180 basis points or so. But the main reason is that PBM business. So they diversify with that PBM business. Everyone needs drugs. They do generic drugs, or excuse me, specialty drugs. And with the rise of cancer, uh, you know, there's more need for those specialty drugs. In terms of humana, analysts are still trying to figure out what happened. They're saying that they basically mispriced their plans on the year. Um, but again, they did better with that Medicare business. So that was really the surprise for healthcare outperforming in that sore spot, essentially. Um, but the big difference was that uh, Evercore or that Evernorth, their uh, PBM business. All right, Abigail, thanks a lot. Really appreciate that stock up uh, over 5% on the day. So it's kind of a fun day, Romain, because on the one hand, you have earnings that really matter, yeah. particularly like for tech, Cigna, for example, you have Chevron, but then it does feel like the macro jobs and Fed is leading yeah. the bond market. So I feel like there are different narratives happening. There are different narratives, but they're still kind of correlated to a certain extent. And you kind of wonder whether there's something needs to be reconciled there. If you bought into the macro story, would Me? you? I? I, it's a hypothetical question. I do have these hypothetical questions. Okay, do it. Yeah. Usually, so what's the like, question? yeah, usually, like you know, Carol Nasser will just ignore my question, but but you're nicer. I won't, Don't I tell her I said. You? Don't tell her I said that. But um, but hypothetically, I mean, we talk about this idea: Do you chase after the macro signals, or do you chase after the corporate fundamental signals? I think it's a really tough yeah. call because I don't know how you front run. Yeah. I don't know how you front run the macro yeah. when they're, you're already ahead. Like, how do you reconcile three cuts like Tom Porcelli was saying versus five to six of what the market's still pricing in? How do you get there? And how do you get there if you're not getting one in March and looks like now we might not be getting one in May either? See, soup, soup cans and gold, man. This is this is the way. All right, I'm very risk averse. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about all things tech after this week's monster rally with Joanne Feeney, partner and portfolio manager over at Advisors Capital Management. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. Ten minutes to go, Alex, until we get to those closing bells. Another rally here on the day and setting up for a fourth straight week of gains. I mean, record high, record high, record high, record high. Let's yeah. talk about a couple things here. One, you're looking at Meta. Oh, record high. Did I mention that? Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, 20 percent. You're not supposed to see that kind of move on a stock uh, like Meta. On the downside for the S&P, though, uh, you have charters. So they basically lost some bar. Their broadband users uh, didn't come in as the street was expecting. They were looking for some weakness, but this was particularly weak, and that's kind of driving down. That's the worst performing stock in the S&P. I just want to point out, do you know that Amazon now has a bigger market cap than uh, Alphabet? I saw that. That happened in the middle of the day. Huge yeah. moment. A huge moment here. And, I mean, we started off the show kind of talking about all the cost-cutting measures that Zuckerberg took, and to, for mm -hmm. that matter, Andy mm -hmm. Jassy. And you remember, particularly with Zuckerberg, there was a lot of derision when that was first announced, yeah. and he proved it right. Here's my question. What's the, the question? year of efficiency was 2023. Yeah. Are we assuming the year of efficiency for names like Amazon and Meta continue in 2024? And if oh. they don't, are we in for disappointment? Because they're still spending on CapEx. Oh, I think so. If you look really go through that earnings release for both of those companies here, I mean, there's certainly growth there. But right. those results are really the product of tightening the belt. Let's just be clear about that. Yeah, exactly. And these, and it, but you know, look, I think some investors will take it because it really is tech stocks. They drove the rally in 2023, and they drove the rally this week here 
pushing stocks back to record highs. And our next guest says growth actually isn't all that pricey, even in the face of recent gains. Joanne Feeney joining us right now. She's a partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management. And she points out that the likes of NVIDIA, AMD, Broadcom, Microsoft, they're good picks in her view. Joanne joining us now for more on that. And Joanne, I'm sure you know everybody, every time you see these stocks pop, everybody goes to look at those valuations. They go to look at the RSI and the technical levels. By all traditional measures, a lot of these stocks look stretched. But there are other measures out there people are looking at, and they're saying there's maybe more to the story. Do you find that? Yeah, Romain, you've certainly got to pick and choose your, your spots. But some of those names that you listed, you know, we've been in them for a while, and we think it's still worth owning them. Uh, the, the important comparison to make uh, is not just price to earnings, because that is a static snapshot. It is just the next 12 months of earnings. What you care about is what this company can do for you over the next several years. And I think that is the realization that's come to a lot of investors over the last 12 or so months with the uh, g growth of the cloud and with the new applications that people are referring to as generative AI. And so people are recognizing there's a lot more growth for a lot of these companies than expected. And that's what makes the valuations attractive, even after the run-ups we've seen in several of these companies. Is there a fund fundamental way to model that, Joanne, or do you just kind of have to go by your gut on this? No, no, you can look at a longer-term discounted cash flow model, for example. Uh, and, and that's giving you, know, you some way to balance the current price to the next 12 months of earnings relative to the growth that you expect over the next, say, five years. So you really should be doing that for these growth companies so that you can see how much are you expecting or do you need for growth to be delivered in order to justify spending this many dollars on this particular stock. Um, Joanne, silly question. Are they still growth companies? Duh, because like they, they had hum tremendous growth. But when you're paying that kind of payout, and, you're, and a lot of the, the juice is coming from cost cutting, can you really value them at the same kind of growth multiple that you would have, say, two years ago? Yeah, tremendous, Alex, that they are doing that, right? And, and so what we care about is not just the growth in sales. We care about the growth in earnings. And so for a company uh, to be able to cut back on its operating expenses and raise operating margins means a faster conversion of sales into profits. Now, companies can't cut costs every year forever, right? Whereas they can grow sales for the very long distant future. But still, if you can get five years of, of margin expansion because of new streamlining and costs or, say, adoption of AI, uh, to streamline costs, then that, that's a positive for five years' worth of extra earnings growth, and that's going to help buoy the valuations on a lot of these growth companies. What's your barbell to that, Joanne? Yeah, so, you know, Alex, I'm not sure what you mean by barbell. But oh, we, I mean, like, we, so if you're going to go into the growthy names, you still like them, what do you do to right. offset the risk? Yeah, so what we do um, in our balance strategy, for example, where we have a lot of folks that are retired, and they're looking for income. And so we actually do a barbell approach in that strategy and build in some growth names like, say, a Broadcom or a Microsoft or an Amazon. And on the other side of that, we put in some higher dividend yielding companies. We'd like to deliver around 3% yield on the equity side for our mainline balance strategy. Uh, folks tend to live on that. And so we put in you know, energy companies like, say, Chevron uh, or, say, Exxon or, or Kinder Morgan in the pipeline business, companies that pay higher than average dividend. Um, Philip Morris is a good stable company to throw in and some defensive companies like maybe a, a TJ Maxx um, or some other consumer staples uh, help to to balance the risk that you might be taking on the growth side with more stable sales, a little mm -hmm. bit less cyclical and higher dividend yield. I, I am curious then, uh, I mean, all those sound great. So we've kind of talked about growth. We've talked about the income and to a certain extent, defensive uh, strategies as well for those folks that want to do that. When you move outside the world of equities, particularly into uh, fixed income, whether we're talking treasuries or even uh, corporate markets here, is there an attractive trade there? And I'm not talking like a short term tactical trade, but really longer term bets being made right now in the here and now. Yeah, what we like to do, given the opportunities that the fixed income market is providing us, particularly you know, for our fixed income clients and our balanced clients, is to pick a mix right now of corporate bonds that have an average duration of, say, three to four to seven years, three to four years-ish. And that's uh, giving our clients a, a four, five, six percent yield, which is going to last them a lot longer than if they tried to go short term into, say, treasuries. Uh, and so that's an opportunity we think is going to sort of stabilize the portfolio, 
uh, it's going to be a lot less volatile than equities, and it's going to still deliver a lot of income. So that also helps to, uh, to stabilize portfolios for our clients. All right, Joanne, great to catch up with you. Joanne Feeney, partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management, helping us count down to the close here on this Friday afternoon. Just about three minutes until we get to the closing bells. Alex, stocks right now, right around their session highs on the day. Kind of interesting day, though, because you talk about an S&P where about half the stocks, more than half the stocks are in the red. But that doesn't matter when you have a name like Meta up 20 percent, a weighting like Amazon up about 8 percent, and even NVIDIA up about 5 I'm also looking at the small cap index, so the yeah. RTY, right? Yeah. Closing down about four tenths of one percent, yeah. but we were down pretty substantially earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you have Savita Subramani and Bank of America saying, like, look, we're not positioned for a macro recovery in things like small caps and cyclicals. And I have to wonder if there is an opportunity there. I mean, yeah. not for me with my gold and the soup cans, but still. But I do wonder how, do, how, how does she reconcile that with the strong labor market data and the yep. other strong economic data here? There is a cyclical trade there if you are buying into that data. Maybe the issue is people don't think that's going to last. Well, also, if you are paying more for workers, that's not going to be good for the Russell, for the small cap guys yeah. at the same time. Well, it's good for the workers, and in theory, for the good they for their economy stuff. if they buy more stuff and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we're not economists, but we do play one on TV. Literally. As we move closer to the closing <laughs> bells, our full market coverage right here on Bloomberg starts as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. We're joined here in our TV studio by Scarlett Fu, Carol Masser, and Tim Senevic in our radio studio as all of our Bloomberg platforms converge for probably one of the most scintillating eight minutes you're ever going to have in your life. It's Carol Masser, 1% higher on the S&P 500. Hail, hail, the gang's all here. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of pressure, Tim. Uh, Live up to it. It's pretty impressive. Aspire. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Uh, we know what you know. what's really uh, the momentum behind the trade, really the tech names. I was just looking at the you know NASDAQ 100 versus the S&P 500. It's kind of a split in the S&P 500, gainers versus losers. But you look at something like the NASDAQ 100, and most of the names are higher in today's session. So we know where that momentum is coming from. Yeah, I know that I know it's coming from the tech players, but still, even after this morning's jobs report, we're still seeing significant buying. And that actually surprised me a little bit. I did see it temper uh, the, the buying a little bit earlier, Scarlett. But as the day has worn on, stocks have continued to move higher. And I'm just a little surprised, given how hot that report was, that investors are still so optimistic. Yeah, I'm just kind of struck dumb by the chart there of the intraday for the Dow or the S&P or the Nasdaq. It's a steady move higher. There's a bit of a wobble at midday, but pretty much people are interpreting the jobs report as this will be good for corporate earnings down the road. Yeah, well, yeah, doesn't it? I mean, I was looking at some of the uh, sell side calls, particularly when it comes to the rate story and how that feeds into this idea that some of the valuations that they had brought down, now they're bringing back up with the expectation that rates aren't going to come back down that fast. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I still just wonder, though, how efficient these tech companies are going to continue to be. Like, at this point, is yeah. this the peak? Is hmm. this the peak? Yeah, that's a good it's a good question and one we're going to be asking probably for the next few weeks and potentially months here. But let's just take the victory lap for a week that looked like it was going to be a down week, ending on a high note, 133 points, 134 points higher on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, good for a gain of about four-tenths of a percent. That's your relative laggard, or at least compared to the S&P and NASDAQ. The S&P 500 higher by 52 points or about 1%. This is actually going to be the first time that we've had back-to-back 1% -back gains on the S&P 500 since the start of November. That's also going to be good for fourth straight weeks of gains. Similar story for the NASDAQ composite, up for a fourth straight week on the back of a 1.7% gain on the day. And as Alex Steele was just talking about on the television program, your big laggard on the day, some of those cyclical stocks, the Russell 2000, Carol, down six tenths of a percent. All right, guys. And as we dig a little bit deeper into the S&P 500, as we said, kind of a split day, 223 names to the upside, 276 to the downside, four unchanged. Guys, want to guess what the best performing name in the S&P 500 is <laughs> yes. this week? I can Peloton. Guess. <laughs> Wrong. Yeah. Try again. Meta, Meta, Meta. Meta, 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 Meta platforms. Facebook. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Up more than 20% today. Can I just point or this out? this week. What? Well, you just sent the redhead. It added $197 billion <laughs> in market cap. You know. The biggest gain in market history. And we remember, what was it, a couple years ago when it was like Apple and Amazon on the same day? Or no, it wasn't the same day, excuse yeah. me. Amazon was like first, and then a few months later, Apple, and they were like right around $191 billion. Everybody thought that's just insane. So less than 18 months ago, yeah. 
uh, meta platforms, you know, rebranded as meta platforms. Yeah. The fall of 2022, shares fell. Everybody was like, okay, what's going on with this company? We're going to, a lot of people left it for dead. It's up more than 450% yeah. in that time. It and also, know, laid, you know, also laid off a lot of you people. You know who's had a really, but, really good day? Who? Yes. Mark Zuckerberg. But, but the, but the Except his taxes. But the two oh, point. Stop. Well, <laughs> taxes. I love it, Alex. Until love he it. sells, there's no taxes. All right, so his accountants is, also had a okay. good day. Is he, is he, okay. No, he just borrows is against the really shares. Is he really fair on taxes? I mean, <laughs> come on. I mean, he's a billionaire. Hey, he hey, hey. Oh, but in all seriousness, but to Tim's point, too, though, what got them that 400% gain? It wasn't the metaverse. No, it wasn't. It, wasn't. AI. No, you're it was good old fashioned right. ad sales on that core business, yeah. which is exactly what investors. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because you remember every time you've had these big sell offs in meta, whether it was a Cambridge Analytical scandal mm -hmm. or some of the other uh, big missteps they made, you always saw this big rebound and it always came for the same reason a refocus on what made them what they are. And that's basically they're a social media platform with yeah. a gigantic ad business. Yeah, they're, they're bread and butter. And let's not forget also the implications of a 50 cent uh, a share dividend and the $50 billion stock buyback were sweeteners for mm -hmm. investors and maybe broadens their investor base as well now that their growth stock uh, that's growing gangbusters and a dividend payer as well. All right, let's take a look at the sector performances here. And what you're seeing is uh, communication services, that's Meta, consumer discretionary, that's Amazon, and Infotech, that's NVIDIA leading the way. The laggards here are utilities, REITs, and material stocks. All right, guys, let's get to some of the individual gainers today. Uh, no no surprises. I've got Meta and Amazon both on them. As we talk about kind of the ongoing superlatives when it comes to both of these names, Meta in particular, um, both of them, you know, tightening their belts, cost cutting. That was something that was a theme with all of our conversations with a lot of the tech names. Um, outperforming Amazon reported its best online sales growth since early in the pandemic. Both of them, uh, robust sales for Amazon, strong profit outlook. We know the stories, uh, but nonetheless, you had meta platforms up more than 20% in today's session. Switch it on over to Amazon, uh, just finishing off its highs of the days, about a 7.9% gain. And then for something a little bit different, although I thought it was interesting, we had an IPO yesterday, Amherst Sports continuing to climb in today's session. Um, of course, it's IPO up about 15% in the past two days, adding another 11% alone in uh, the Friday trade, guys. Did, did you, saw those did you see Decker's Wilson's today? You don't have it on your board. I, I, I know you're I a big did. Uggs fan. I didn't. But, I do like yeah. Uggs. I've had multiple pairs. <laughs> and the dogs okay. have also chewed Is that, multiple well, pairs. Well, that closed at a do, record high today. They, they own Hoka, right, too, it. right? A lot of them. They own Hoka, yeah. and that mm -hmm. drove a lot, and, of course, uh, uh, the Uggs and everything else. There, yeah. were, there was a lot to choose from today, I have to say. Uh, well, you did a decent job. Thank you. Okay, breathe a sigh of relief because Apple stayed in the red for me. This was, you know, moving between gains and losses today. But Apple did end up falling half a percentage point or closing half a percentage point lower. It was as down as much as 4% earlier in the session, but bounced back. Investors looking past a deepening slump in its China business. Investors continue to digest that earnings report throughout the day. Stronger iPhone sales in the holiday quarter returned to revenue growth following four straight declines. But demand in China, uh, certainly a spot that investors are keeping an eye on. Did you see the footage there. of the release of the Vision Pro? Oh, we've been talking no. about it all day. No. Was it cool? Was well, it amazing? I, I haven't even tried it yet. Tim but Cook was there. He was in New York. He was just down yeah. the street. Yeah. Isn't it's amazing. Stick? I don't know. Isn't I mean, if Tim Cook's at the Apple store trying yeah. to hand out Vision Pros, yeah. what does that say about the Vision Pro? He's got Pro? to stand in line like everybody else, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. We <laughs> described, Bloomberg News described the crowds as, quote, <laughs> modest, which I thought was oh. notable. I mean, look, it's a well, $3,500 device. You know you, can, you know you can buy everything online now, Tim. Mark Gurman you can, is still but there's still something about lining up at these Apple events. I mean, <laughs> even, even not for me, but yeah, iPhones still bring people out there. I mean, yeah. I remember being one of those reporters in the beginning of time when, like, you had to go and at an iPhone event, you get up at, like, 2 yeah. in the morning, you go and you survey everybody. Here's something that we didn't talk about, guys, that much is what we've seen in the bond market today. Because typically, we see this kind of move in bonds. You'd be like, oh, whoa. Oh, yeah, we had a jobs report. Right. <laughs> we have seen the, the, the two-year yield of 16 basis points, right? We haven't mm -hmm. seen that. At one point, uh. was the highest uh, since March. Uh, Keep same going, deal, Alex. Ignore him. Uh, with ignore the 10. Him. I'm ignoring you? Good. Why am no, I ignoring no, you? No, ignore him. No, go ahead. Are you bored with bonds? No. 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 This is, don't, you can't listen to Carol. No. Is this go ahead, problem? Alex. Go, go, Come go. On, Alex. You got to, I mean, I know you're new to this show, but it's just true. just know. Carol just disrupts everything. Yeah. Right. Okay. So to that point, <laughs> yields are up, guys. That was dramatic. That's rich. It didn't have anything to do with stocks, though. As stocks were up despite yields being up. Thank you. Pretty impressive, right? <laughs>
I yes, do. I agree. Pretty impressive. I always to, tell them, you know, it feels uh, like I'm back at home with my six brothers and sisters, yeah. and this is exactly how it feels. That's the sign of a great workplace, Carol, okay? <laughs> when all of us can just make you feel like family, right? Um, I, like it. I like the optimism there. I mean, Scarlett, let's yeah. go back to the bond market, right? It's been kind of impressive, like the volatility and the back and like forth. That. I feel like Jay Powell, it's Are, like his crystal ball, like he knew what was going on. He knew on. what was going on. His timing was perfect, right? You know, mm -hmm. he hey. said marches off the table, or he didn't say those words exactly. He said March uh, is very class. unlikely, and the data came in to reinforce that idea that, yeah, maybe March is pretty unlikely at this point. Yeah. Okay, so, well, I want to talk about something bigger here. You you mentioned Jay Bigger Powell, than Scarlett. rate cuts? Pexatoni yeah, no, 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 I want to talk about Jay Powell being on 60 Minutes on Sunday. Ah, uh, yes. And the significance of that. Because if you think about the audience that Jay Powell speaks to, right, you know, people like us are, are glued to every comment that we hear from the Fed chair. But it's a pretty big deal when he goes on a program like 60 Minutes. And I'm wondering what the message that he has for Americans this time and how it's different from the last time he went on when we were in the throes of an inflationary environment and they were trying to get inflation under control. So, Tim, I actually think that I've been thinking something similar. And I'm actually wondering if how people feel and what the data is, there's still a wide gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering Agreed. if his goal is to try and bridge that gap. I have no idea. I'm just wondering exactly the same point. What is the goal for him on Sunday? Well, I think that's it. I mean, remember when they did those uh, Fed decide or excuse me, uh, those Fed listens events. Fed uh, decides I mean, is our program. No, yeah, right. Fed listens. <laughs> uh, I Fed, remember it. Fed listens a little bit less Thank dynamic you, than uh, Tom, John, and Lisa, but but the same concept, which is really the, what you were talking about, which is the idea that there was this disconnect between uh, expectations amongst quote unquote real Americans versus maybe what the market had, and of course what the wonky economists have, and the idea that you did need to sort of bridge that gap here. Uh, so we'll see what he. Has has to say, but as you uh, point out, the audience uh, for 60 Minutes maybe skews a little um, older. Not true. Kaylee Lines watches it every single week. Kaylee well, Lines we, is not your ordinary American. It's true. I think All it's right. safe to say. I'm going to say my husband and I, like, we either watch it live or we, you know, put it on the DVR and we watch it. We have dinner usually around it. So the DVR, wow. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> All right, guys. Okay. Alex and Scarlett have a great have, like, weekend. A, like, the other one, uh, do whatever. Okay. <laughs> Have, like, no. a bowl have a great like, and safe weekend. Right have a great and quicker. safe weekend. Maybe he'll be asked about regional <laughs> banks. I'm thinking about that. All right, guys. It's Friday. That is a wrap across When's platform. Your... Radio TV. I can't hear you. Radio TV, YouTube. She's not uh, listening. Bloomberg Originals. We will see you again on Monday. All right, our coverage continues here on Bloomberg Television. There was a lot of talk this morning about that job support, a blowout job support that exceeded almost everyone's expectations. We do want to go down to Washington right now for the Biden administration's take on that report. Gene Sperling, White House American Rescue Plan coordinator and senior advisor to the president joining us right now. And Gene, I'm sure you know a lot of people have been really wringing their hands about this economy. Is it strong? Is it soft? We've at least gotten a couple of labor market reports over the last two months that continue to show added jobs, but also increases in wages. Look, I, I think you're understating that. I, I think not only uh, has Goldilocks uh, arrived, but perhaps superhero Goldie, Goldilocks has arrived. I mean, if you think about these last several months, in a period where a year ago people were projecting recession, you had 3.3 percent growth in the fourth quarter, you've now had an average of almost 300,000 jobs a month in the last three quarters. You've had way, real wage gains up, and now you see six-month uh, PCE inflation yeah. at 2 percent, 1.9 for core. Uh, you know, that, that again, that's not just normal Goldilocks, that's, that's pretty superhero Goldilocks. Is this translating down the wire, I guess, to regular people. I understand economists understand this. People in the markets understand this. But we have so much anecdotal evidence from people on the ground. They still look at prices in the grocery store or other uh, sort of costs that they have. And they say, I'm not doing as well as I was before, even though I may be making more money than I was before. You know, listen, I've, I've always said every family is the world's greatest expert on how they're doing. And I think you have a lot of American families who have been through a few years of, of COVID. They saw the, uh, the COVID period. They saw the, you know, the, the spike in inflation. And even if they, in 2022, and even if they intellectually understand that was due to global forces and the pandemic and the, the war in Ukraine still doesn't help much. There's, a, there's pain when you're going down that grocery line or at the gas pump. But, but I think what you're starting to see 
is that this better news is sinking in for people. And I don't just say that anecdotally. We just saw the final Michigan Consumer Confidence numbers. And in two months, the current conditions indicator, two months, has gone up 20%. Mm -hmm. the, pres the expectation for the present has gone up 36%. Yes. So I think what you're seeing is that a lot of people you know, are starting to believe things are getting better. And, you know, yes, uh, a cup, some prices like eggs or milk aren't all the way right. back to where they were, but they're down a bit. I just got, I was traveling with the president in my home state of Michigan yesterday, and I'd say every single uh, uh, gas place we went by was a little under $3. So, uh, and sure. then I think people are, are hearing the better news coming out and they're starting to feel a little better. So, you know, the people don't turn on and off. I think you're seeing things start to sink in a little. You know, I was here in 1996 right. with President Clinton. We saw a bit of the same thing right around this period. So I got to ask you, Gene, about the other big story that we're covering here, which is the renewed weakness in some regional banks. New York Community Bank's provision for bad commercial real estate loans were 10 times bigger than what analysts had expected. We went through this regional banking turmoil last March. What's your worry that this might spark a new round of turmoil for regional banks? You know, look, when you're in the White House, uh, even if you're not the person at one of the, the, the supervisory agencies or the Fed, you're always watching, you're always looking at everything. But I do think these underlying issues that we're seeing in the overall strength of the economy, uh, you know, you've seen just even the little bit of, of positive feeling from mortgage rates going to even around six and a half percent. So, uh, look, you know, you always have to keep your eye on on weakness. But right now, what we really are seeing is is really broad based, solid yeah. growth that's more that's sustainable. It's mm -hmm. not the five not point nine percent we had in in 20 uh, uh, 2021. We're, we're just where you want to be a sustainable growth path, a, a very strong job market. And yet inflation under control. And I think one thing people will be talking about more is these productivity numbers. Now, I understand all the volatility can happen in productivity numbers, but you've had three quarters of over 3% yeah. productivity. And that could be part of the answer to how we're seeing higher wages, stronger job market, and yet still declining inflation. All right, Gene Sperling, White House American Rescue Plan Coordinator. Thank you so much for joining us today from the White House. He is, of course, a senior advisor to President Biden. Um, you know, it brings me back to the idea here as the White House, of course, has to get its talking points in order when it comes to the strong economy. How Jay Powell is going to communicate um, this very what seems to be contradictory nature of the market and of the economy to the American people on Sunday when he talks on 60 Minutes. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I think, you know, it's not tr trickling down. And this is normal. We see this all the time here where you have a disconnect between what's happening in terms of real fiscal policy, yeah. real monetary policy, and what people see on the ground. I'm always going to believe the people on the ground. They may have a very singular view of the world, but that view matters. That view matters, and that's what that's what dominates their decision-making process. Yeah, you just and can't be in the ivory tower crunching No, numbers. absolutely. you got to so be out there. Jay Powell will be speaking on Sunday. Of course, we'll be monitoring the headlines when those come along. But we want to continue the conversation on the labor economy. And so coming up, we're going to speak with Dana Peterson. She is chief economist for the conference board. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu with Romain Bostic. Let's show you how markets close on the day because it turns out good economic news can be good for the market, at least for the stock market. The S&P 500 climbing to a record high, approaching 5,000 on the better than expected jobs report for the month of January. That same jobs report, however, sent treasuries lower, pushing yields up the two year, which is much more sensitive to Fed policy, rose from 4.22% to 4.4%, currently at 4.36%. That's a 16 basis point move right there. The dollar, uh, 
uh, moving higher by six tenths of one percent as rate cut hopes get pushed out further. Uh, we should mention that the dollar, by the way, is approaching the highest level since the Fed pivot back in December. But when you come to the equity market once again, it's really the magnificent seven that's driving so much of it, up more than five percent. The group had its best day in about a year, thanks in huge part to meta platforms, closing at a record high up 20 percent on the day. Big follow through from earnings that crushed Wall Street estimates. And of course, it announced its first dividend and a 50 billion dollar stock buyback. And it's not just big tech either. You're looking at big oil with Chevron and Exxon reporting earnings that topped analyst estimates. Uh, Charter Communications and Genrad were both lower. Uh, Charter, of course, falling the most more than a year, reporting losses in video Internet customers and actually said that there may be more to come. Genrad reported earnings that missed analyst estimates. But but of course, the big headline of the day was the jobs report. And what we would look at here is the orange bars uh, that tracks payrolls. And what we've seen is that for a second straight month, the economy added more than 300,000 jobs that topped even the most optimistic forecast. You take January over here, the last bar. We learned that 353,000 jobs were added. The blue line tracks the consensus. The green line tracks the most bullish estimate, which was 300,000. Similar story for December of last year. This is a clear turnaround from the previous half year when the orange bars were below the green lines and the blue lines going all the way back to June 2023. So. What does this say about the conventional wisdom that the labor market was cooling down, reflecting the impact of all those rate hikes since early 2022? Or remain, is this perhaps a fluke of the weather, as some people have argued? Well, of course, uh, that labor market report underpinned that huge uh, move that we saw in the Treasury market. Of course, that big move in yields, a move that we haven't seen going back to March of last year. Liz Kapil McCormick joining us right now for a little bit of a closer look here at some of the moves that we saw in that Treasury space. And Liz, I I'm not so much surprised that we saw a little bit of a reversal in that pricing. I was a little bit surprised by the magnitude. Yeah, I think, you know, after on at the FOMC meeting, Powell kind of said, which people were surprised that March isn't likely that that was a little bit of a gut check. But then there were people were kind of waiting. Oh, maybe jobs will really be bad. I heard someone I won't say who talking. It could be negative. And of course, you just laid out how strong it was. So I think that was the final straw that just yields took off. Um, but I will say what's interesting is even though yields are up across the curve, double digits, every maturity, you do have the market, even though they gave up March, they're not even fully priced for a May hike. They're still pricing in, you know, several cuts more than the Fed has signaled this year. So I think that kind of feeling that they are going to move and cut rates eventually is going to stay unless we get a resurgence in inflation, right? So people are looking next week at the end of the week, we have CPI revision. The next week is the actual next CPI. Right. I think I think if that goes the wrong way, then you're going to see more rates up. But if it kind of keeps going, then maybe this, you know, Eventual easing will stay there and kind of cap how high yields can go in a mm. sense. Well, we know the FOMC statement removed that tightening bias uh, mention, but is anyone out there saying that perhaps the uh, tightening should perhaps still be on the table or that uh, maybe Powell pivoted too early too quickly? Yeah, I think most people think that's not the case because, you know, just the technical wonky stuff if inflation keeps coming down, they don't want the real policy rate too high. But you did hear a few traders say it at least begs the question, like people start asking, is this thing a game changer, right? Um, uh, do we have to think about, you know, should they hike again? I, I don't think that's going to kind of come to fruition, even in traders' minds, again, unless... You know, the death nail to this would be that inflation going back yeah. up right now. You know, Chair Powell talked a lot about, I, you know, kept going through the transcript today, sustainable. Like, yes, inflation is coming down to target in some six months measures below 2%. Yeah. But we, we're not sure and we need to see it's on a sustainable path. So that's kind of his go to thing now. All right, uh, Liz, going to have to leave it there. Liz Capo McCormick here, a closer look at some of the moves in yields on the back of that jobs report. We do want to continue that conversation about the labor market report, but we do have some breaking news crossing the wire. First on Bank of America and Brian Moynihan and his compensation in the most recent year being cut slightly down by about 3.3 percent to $29 million. That was his total comp in 2023. The bulk of that, more than $27 million, uh, of course, coming through a share awards. The rest of that are on the base a salary aside. Uh, we'll get you some more details on that. Uh, we should also point out another headline also on the Bloomberg terminal right now, too. Uh, this involving the military situation in the Middle East. We are now getting confirmation that the U.S. has begun those retaliatory strikes 
uh, related to that deadly drone attack in Jordan that killed at least three uh, service members. We're also going to try to get you some details on that as well. A lot going on here uh, in the after hours trading here, but we do want to turn back to that labor market report that came pre-market. It was a blockbuster report, no matter how you slice and dice it. Dana Peterson joining us right now, the chief economist over at the conference board. And I don't think the strength itself uh, is of any concern, but there is some concern here, Dana, about some of the wage growth and whether we should now be really thinking about this idea of a potential resurgence in inflation. Did you see anything in there that gave you pause? Well, looking at wages, you certainly saw an uptick overall. And we know that wages have been rising for those industries that are looking for workers, like manufacturing and construction, as a lot of reshoring is prompting buildings of new manufacturing facilities in the U.S. Um, so I think that the Fed still has to keep a close eye on wages. Indeed, when you look at what's driving services inflation away from housing, it's a lot of things that uh, in sectors where they are experiencing labor shortages, companies are not letting people go, but they are willing to pay them more money to attract them and, attain and retain them. Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, do you see anywhere within the labor report evidence of a labor surplus in any of the sectors? No, not really. Um, when we look at the data, we kind of split it up into those uh, areas where they've been continuing to add jobs, certainly leisure and hospitality, government and healthcare and social services. Those sectors are still trying to catch up from all the people who were let go or left the industry during the pandemic. And then away from that, we actually saw, you know, some industries that were letting people go, especially tech and finance. But over the last two months, we saw some turnaround in some of those industries and indeed temporary help services, which had been negative most of last year, ticked up. So it doesn't seem like there's really much in the way of a surplus. It's just the fact that you know, it seems like maybe executives are coming a little bit out of the funk and are looking to add some more workers going forward. We know that Jay Powell made clear that he or the committee is seeking greater confidence of more good data that inflation is easing. How much does this jobs report qualify as more good data or does it do the opposite, uh, raise concerns that inflation could stall at above 2 percent? I think it's both messages. So on the one hand, the labor market is still strong. Um, the prospect of a soft landing is increasing. Certainly, we had very strong GDP growth. Labor markets are healthy. Certainly, for the last two months, unemployment's low. But wages are still well above pre-pandemic levels. And that's going to feed into consumer inflation, which risks that, that likelihood of an, of an inflation smile where inflation doesn't go back to 2 percent, but reaccelerate. So that's something the Fed really does have to watch. And wages are kind of the canary in the coal mine for that. That gets us back to the question we were talking about with our previous guests, uh, uh, Dana, this idea of how many rate cuts are priced into this market. We came into that this, this week with the market expecting five to six. That's now been ratcheted down to roughly about four and a half to five here. I'm wondering, should that expectation be ratcheted down even more? I think it should be. Again, the Fed is looking for more good data. So that includes inflation. When you look at inflation gauges, they're still notably above 2%. And the thing is that they want to be confident that inflation is going to be returned to 2% sustainably. That means hang out there and not reaccelerate or even go much below. So I think the Fed needs more data, more reports for that to happen. And so that means we're probably looking at maybe the middle of the year, June, before rate cuts happen. And those rate cuts are probably going to be gradual, maybe 25 basis points per meeting. So that sounds more like, you know, three to four cuts than five or six. All right, Dana, always wonderful to talk to you. Dana Peterson there, chief economist over at the conference board, a closer look at the labor market report and the conditions around the expectations for rate cuts this year. All right, when we return, a look back on this day in history and the introduction of paper currency in the U.S. And we leave you with a question on that before we go to commercial. You ready for this, Scarlett? Yeah. What is the total value of physical U.S. dollars currently in circulation worldwide? Worldwide is the key question because so ah. much more of it is outside of the U.S. than here. All right. Well, we'll give you a couple minutes uh, to mold that over here and dun, the answer dun, dun, when we dun, come back dun, dun, after the break. Dun, dun, this is dun, the close dun, dun, on Bloomberg. Dun, 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 dun.
Welcome back to The Close. On this day, we take a look back here at the creation of what would become the almighty U.S. dollar. It was February 3rd, 1690, when the Massachusetts Bay Province created the first government-issued paper currency in the New World. Now, it was basically just a bill of credit intended to pay down military debt, but other colonies, they followed suit. And shortly after the American Revolution began in 1775, the 13 colonies jointly issued a continental currency. It was a disaster. The continental currency was valued relative to each state's local economy. And since there was no coordination of monetary policy between Congress and the states, runaway inflation was commonplace, as was counterfeiting. But after the war, Alexander Hamilton started a three-pronged effort to expand the new federal government's control over fiscal and monetary policy nationwide. That led to the Coinage Act, which established the dollar as the main accounting unit for the nation as a whole. And in 1794, the U.S. Mint started pumping out its first dollar. Well, actually, it was a dollar coin, to be clear. It would take seven more decades, if you can believe that, for the first paper dollar to actually be issued. And that brings us to our big number of the day and the answer to our question. What is the total value of physical U.S. dollars currently in circulation worldwide? The answer, $2.4 trillion. $2.4 trillion, that's spread out among 54 billion pieces of legal tender, the most popular denomination, that would be the $100 Ben Franklin, which now makes up about 34% of the volume of all U.S. paper currency in circulation, or more than 80% of the total value floating around the world. And there's a reason no one ever made a song called All About the Washingtons. Scarlett. <laughs> Great summary, and I'm sure uh, many of those bills are circulating outside the United States as well. Uh, speaking of the Benjamins, let's get back to that news from Bank of America, uh, which is cutting pay for its CEO, Brian Moynihan, by 3.3 percent. Bloomberg Finance reporter Catherine Doherty joins us now. This is the second year now that Brian Moynihan's pay total comp has been reduced, isn't it? That's right. And he's one of the only executives right now to have received a pay cut. Others have either gotten a slight increase uh, or kept the same. But basically what we're seeing is this 3.3% drop is tracking in line with the company's net profit overall, their net income. And so that is down about 3%. And mm -hmm. essentially what, what I'm reading into this is that the board is saying in a year that First of all, among the six largest U.S. banks, their stock is performing the worst in, in 2023. And their profit is down 3%. It's not double digits down. Um, but this is a, a signal that um, it's reflective of overall performance. I wouldn't say it's a massive cut by any means. Last year was 6%, so that's almost double percentage-wise what the cut is this year. Um, but it's not flat, and it's yeah. not up like other banks. Well, given the correlation between, I guess, well, how they compensate them and the growth in the business, the business overall. Are we expecting maybe a potential raise this year? Uh, a raise for Moynihan. For Moynihan. Yeah. I think that if he can prove that he's yeah. still focused on what he calls responsible growth, and that means growing the business, um, but you have to see that in the number, in the profit. And 2023 was, was not a year in which profit had risen in that way. So I guess 2024, it's, it's off to the races, and they'll have to, to prove that there are investments that they're making to push their business forward and to, to grow in what he calls responsibly. All right, uh, Catherine here, a closer look here. Bank of America and uh, Brian Moynihan's pay for last year down about 3.3% to $29 million. We do want to go back to that other big story, and that involves the military situation in the Middle East. The U.S. has launched retaliatory strikes against Iran-backed militias in Syria and in Iraq. Nick Wadhams, he's our Bloomberg News national security reporter, joins us right now for more. What other details do we know about what's going on, Nick? Uh, well, at this point, not a great deal, but uh, we've uh, been told that there have been several strikes in uh, Iraq and Syria. You know, the key issue here is that so far it looks like the Biden administration has elected not to attack targets in Iranian territory. Doing so would have been in even greater escalation as the U.S. has sort of pulled uh, and embroiled deeper into this uh, conflict in the Middle East that touched off with the Hamas attack on October 7th. So. At the moment, um, it does not appear to be the sort of widespread, massive bombardment that some people had feared would really ignite an even broader conflict, but a fairly limited set of strikes. A fairly limited set of strikes and something that took a while, too, to uh, materialize. There had been reports earlier this week that um, and markets were certainly waiting for some kind of response. Why did it take this long, do you think? Well, um, it could be all sorts of factors. You know, there were some critics who had said that President Biden was essentially giving 
some Iranian officials, uh, uh, military commanders, the opportunity to clear out, uh, but it could have been all sorts of other things, you know, cloud cover, weather issues, uh, wanting to make sure that the targets were the right targets. But, you know, what President Biden had said uh, when three U.S. service members were killed on uh, uh, last Sunday in this drone attack on, on Jordan was essentially, listen, we are going to respond at a time and place of our choosing. Uh, so he had made no secret that this was coming, really trying to send a message both to Iran, to the proxies, and also to folks back home saying that we would not allow uh, the killing of these three service members to stand. So we're now seeing this. The big question is whether there will be more to come. We have some indications that there will be a rolling series of strikes over the coming hours and days. So it may not be the last of it tonight, but certainly not in the next several days as the U.S. looks to degrade the capability of these Iranian-backed proxies all over the region. All right, Nick. Uh, Nick Wadhams uh, helps uh, lead our uh, international uh, policy coverage here. A uh, closer look right now at the big headline, the U.S. launching retaliatory strikes in Syria uh, as well as in Iraq. All right, we're going to make a hard pivot from that and turn back uh, to uh, the world of startups, that startup culture, and our next up segment where we highlight the entrepreneurs and founders really moving the needle for our economy, our markets, and, of course, our technology. Our next guest has a number of projects that aim to help people strengthen their financial futures. Evan Lee Parp is a founder of Credit Academy. It's a software platform that effectively helps people manage their debt and, more importantly, uh, pay it down. Evan, great to have you here on the program. And this is kind of timely. I mean, we were just looking at a lot of data here coming out at the end of last year, uh, showing credit card balances in the U.S. right now are really at some of the highest levels we've seen in quite some time. So maybe it's right for folks to start taking a closer look at what they have. How exactly does your software help them do that? Absolutely. Uh, first off, pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, credit card debt just recently passed a trillion dollars for the first time in U.S. history. Uh, what we aim to do is take a proactive approach towards the concept. We like to call ourselves the vitamin instead of the pain pill um, and really educate, right? I was that kid. I turned 18. I got a credit card right away and immediately maxed it out. And basically through this journey, I said, I want to make sure that I build the product that would have helped me when I was younger. So what we aim to do uh, is through education, we basically reward users for what they're learning, not just what they're earning. So Credit Academy is the world's first credit card for the next generation mm -hmm. that places an emphasis on education over spend. Well, but before we get to the educational aspect, I'm curious when we talk about debt settlement and sort of what is being at least marketed uh, through your uh, platform as a pathway to do that here, are you yourself, meaning your company yourself, is it operating in any way as a middleman between uh, the people who owe and the people that they owe the money to? No, so actually we will be offering our own credit cards. Uh, the cards by design will be secured cards where funds go into a high yield savings account versus your traditional credit card. So the user gets to build credit and savings simultaneously. Okay. Uh, so we'll actually be issuing the cards ourselves. And can you tell us a little bit about the partners that you are working with? Because part of your business model involves forming partnerships with smaller banks. And there's concerns about smaller banks, certainly, uh, given they're dealing with high cost of funding and, of course, some uh, loans that may be going bad given uh, the overall slowdown of the economy. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been fortunate to have some strong partners along the way. Um, Equifax has been a partner with us for our preteen product, Kitty Credit. Um, as for Credit Academy, we're working with Discover around this. Uh, we chose them deliberately, knowing that they're the second largest provider of student loans and have some of the best rated student and secured credit cards. So just making sure that we build a product that's going to work best for a younger audience that's getting exposed to credit for the first time. Right. I I'm curious if you've folded crypto into this conversation at all, or, or at what point do you think it would be appropriate to? So on a personal level, I'm a fan of crypto, but what I would say is where we want to focus right now is purely on the concept of credit. Mm. Uh, as we get that right and we understand that users are really understanding how credit works, then we can start to expand into other concepts. So when you talk about credit, it's neither a good thing or a bad thing on its own, but there is bad debt and there is also good debt. What have you found to be the most effective way of explaining the differences between good debt and bad debt to young people? Yeah, absolutely. So credit is one of those things that if you leverage it properly, it is one of the quickest pathways to wealth, right? If you think about some of the biggest generators of wealth in this country, it's equity in a business or ownership in a home. And some of the biggest barriers in those particular instances can be your credit score. Uh, so what we try to tell people is about if you're going to take on debt, make sure it's good debt and it's things that are 
towards the purchase of assets, things that will appreciate in the future, and keeping these concepts simple, especially since we're talking to a younger audience. You started off with this anecdote kind of about your own experience getting a credit card and not kind of, you know, I guess understanding the responsibility. And I think we've all kind of been there. I mean, I remember, I mean, I could just share an anecdote with you myself. I mean, when I was in college, I got an American Express card and I didn't realize that you couldn't carry a balance on an American Express card. So I got a phone <laughs> call saying, hey, buddy, you owe us a couple hundred bucks. Uh, but it gets to the broader yeah. issue here that we don't really have, at least in this country, a really sort of, I guess, consistent way of teaching kids about money. Like, I know some schools now have started to do it a little bit more, but certainly when I was coming up, you just didn't have that. So if you didn't learn it from your parents or, or, or some mentor here, you just kind of had to learn it on your own once you went out there into the real world. Is that changing, though? Is that becoming maybe a little bit better now? I think so. I think we're starting to take a more serious approach towards this and say, hey, we don't want to have this experience for the next generation. Um, and, and how we do it is we break it down in realistic ways. So uh, we're, we're happy to be a part of that conversation, and you're starting to see parents take ownership of it, too. So it's, it takes a village to raise a child, uh, and, it, and I think the majority of Americans are, are starting to join that village when it comes to financial literacy. All right, Evan. Well, I'm very intrigued uh, here uh, by this venture, and we should talk again soon. Evan Leapart, he's the founder of Credit Academy, a software platform uh, that really helps people looking to settle their credit card debts and also I'll just learn about how to manage uh, their money. I remember those days when uh, the credit card companies would try to get students to sign up, right? Oh, yeah. And they would s drop flyers all over the place. Oh, yeah. They know? would they have would... tables set up like in the, in, the, in the yard, just, you know. And no one explained the difference between no, credit card and charge think... card. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, quite a time here. All right. Uh, we want to pivot from that and go back uh, to big tech. Of course, that was the big story of the week. And we actually had a chance to sit down with Jensen Wong, uh, the, of course, the head of NVIDIA, who said that artificial intelligence will matter to every single country and industry on the planet. And that it will drive up sovereign AI demands for his company's products. Ed Ludlow sat down with Jensen just a few, uh, yes, just yesterday. Take a listen. You have seen um, uh, India, Japan, um, uh, France, uh, Canada now, uh, Southeast Asia, Singapore, uh, speak up about the importance of investing in sovereign AI capabilities. Uh, it is, is uh, become abundantly clear to each one of the countries that that their natural resource, which is the data of their country, uh, should be should be um, refined and produce intelligence of their country for their country, and that capability of refining the data of their country of their country and turn it into their artificial intelligence is now possible in a in a quite a quite a democratized way. Almost every country should be able to do it for themselves. And, and um, what's needed, of course, uh, is the technology and the know-how of standing up AI infrastructure. And that's where we could be uh, quite helpful to, to um, uh, various regions. And so I think that the, the recognition of the importance of sovereign AI capabilities is now uh, quite, quite global. How should we think about um, sovereign AI as a business line for you? Is there a way that we can understand how NVIDIA's work, even if it's building supercomputers, like in the UK, for example, what proportion of your overall business that will represent? The vast majority of, of uh, the computing market has been United States and um, to, a small, to a much long, smaller degree, China. Um, for the very first time, every industry would be uh, every single country will become a computer industry and every industry will become a technology industry. And so artificial intelligence or the automation, uh, the production at scale of, of intelligence uh, matters to every single country and matters to every single industry. And so for, for the very first time, there's a, there's a whole new computer market that is going to be uh, in, in every single country and every single, every single market. And um, uh, it, it starts with it starts with, of course, uh, uh, the the native computer industry itself. Uh, but you're seeing you're seeing a great adoption in healthcare, great adoption in logistics, um, uh, in uh, in transportation, of course, uh, in manufacturing, in the large industries, the heavy industries. Uh, for the very first time, because of generative AI, computers are going to be computer technology is going to impact. Uh, literally every single industry in every single country. 
That was Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA. Let's stick with the Magnificent 7 in tech because it is the official release day for Apple's big bet on virtual reality. We're talking about the Vision Pro. Joining us now is not Tim Cook, but Dave Lee, Bloomberg Opinion columnist who was at the actual event in Manhattan's, uh, in Apple's Manhattan flagship store. And you saw Tim Cook putting on those Vision Pro glasses mm -hmm. um, or device. What was your impression of the device? What was the scene like over there? Well, look, this isn't the same scale as, say, when the iPhone came out and there's people around the block and you can see people have been camping out and all that kind of stuff. But it is, you know, it's an exciting moment for Apple because I think it's probably the boldest product they've had since that iPhone and they're relying on it quite a lot to sort of give a sort of optimism around how innovative they can be in the future. You know, what today was about was, you know, you had your pre-orders, the die-hard Apple fans. Obviously, they were each paying $3,500 for this uh, headset, which Apple is calling spatial computing. They don't like the word <laughs> virtual reality. They can't stand that at all. Um, and, you know, the process is you went in, you had a 20-minute kind of cons consultation, and then you left the building uh, $3,500 lighter. So it's, it's like I said, it's going to be a smaller scale product. Did, you, did, at least they, did the people first like walk years. out with the glasses on? Or no, they, they didn't. The box? They didn't. Okay. They walked out in the box and very quickly into an Uber because I suspect uh, walking around New York with a new they, they Pro would yeah. be a smart move. Yeah, you can probably pair that up with like those headphones and you'd be a nice target. And walk, you know, strolling it wouldn't be a good look, right? Yeah. And you'd be bumping into yeah. people. You mentioned this is a niche target, obviously, mm. for a niche audience. Is this something that could eventually become an enterprise tool, something that could be scaled? Look, Apple certainly thinks so. I mean, they, they say there's applications for, uh, you know, for, for enterprise, but things like surgery as well. The consumer angle at the moment is productivity and entertainment. So, you know, watch on a big screen in front of you as if you're at an IMAX or something like mm. that. Yeah. The issue there is how many other companies are going to get on board? We've seen Netflix haven't made an app for it. YouTube hasn't made an app for it. Yeah. So there is a question about the adoption and whether other companies are going to be interested enough. Yeah for a while to do that. Well, that's a nice segue into Meta, because, I mean, they got those, what is it, the Ray-Bans or something like that? Or Ray-Bans, the Quest as the, well, the, which the, is the Quest. Similar. Yeah, we had one of those in our household, and it lasted, like, you know, five days. But, <laughs> but we get, but, like, is this, but is this the future? Because, I mean, whether it's the Vision Pro or Ray-Bans or whatever Google's working on, is this some type of sort of wearing something on our face that is basically a computing device? Is that really going to be the future? I mean, look, I think what's yeah. difficult is, you know, when the phone comes out, we all look at it and go, I know what I can do with the iPhone from yes. day one. Yeah. Right? The problem with virtual reality or spatial computing, or whatever we want to call it, is that there's this gap between what could be possible and whether we think we really want that. Yeah. And I feel like we're at a time where less connectivity seems like the better option for most people. Now, in terms of Meta, I mean, they have the Quest, like you, like you mentioned. They've gone for a sort of cheaper approach. That's $500, so yeah. seven times cheaper than, than the, the Apple device. And it's a less premium device, but also it's more freeing. You can do exercise. Yeah. And I think exercise is perhaps one of these early uses mm. that people might actually get on board with. In the same way that people love Pelotons, mm -hmm. maybe you have virtual reality for fitness, but it, it, hasn't, it, it hasn't happened yet. It gets to a broader question, particularly given that we had all these tech earnings, primarily from tech companies that are very mature mm. uh, now. Uh, you know, these aren't the new kids on the block. And everybody's wondering what the next act is going to be for a company of this size, whether it's Apple, whether it's Meta, Alphabet, Amazon, whoever here. Was there anything that you heard out of the earnings reports this week that gave you, I guess, a little bit more comfort that the behemoths really do have a pivot up ahead? Well, I mean, look, Meta certainly had its coming yeah. of age, right? It had its first ever stock dividend. That was seen as, A, a sign of confidence because it said this isn't a one-off. We're going to be doing that every quarter from now on. But what I also think it did was give Meta in particular the license to go after those new ideas, right? Yeah. Because in the past, um, we've seen when Meta comes out and says, oh, you know, we lost $4 billion on, on VR this quarter and so forth, investors go, oh, gosh, well, you need to make layoffs, you need to do this mm. and that. By doing this dividend, not only is Meta saying, well, look, we'll spend money, but we'll put it into your pockets as well as investors, but they're also saying, you know, look over here, look at all the good things that are going on, and let us invest in the future, knowing that we can, we can do both things here and achieve both. And I think that is a maturing for, for Meta. It shows that they don't have to you know, rely so much yeah. on putting all their eggs in one basket. All right, Dave, this was great. Now, did you actually buy a pair of those Vision Pros? Or you just, <laughs> yeah, Were you just tempted a little bit? I thought maybe come back and ask me when it's half price. I think oh. it would be, it would be <laughs> at a minimum, I think. Apple doesn't cut okay. things by well, half price. No, that's very true. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, Dave Lee, a Bloomberg Opinion columnist. A closer look at what was, of course, a really big week uh, for tech. And as we push ahead to next week, it's still going to be a big week for earnings, but just from a completely different sector. We're going to set you up for what to watch after we come back. This is Bloomberg. We had about 100 in S&P companies report earnings this week. We're going to get about 100 more next week. So it's going to be a much different complexion yep. as the type of companies reporting. One of those is McDonald's. And uh, joining us right now for a preview of what to expect is Nick, Se Nick Setian, Managing Director with a focus on restaurants over at Wedbush Securities. He currently rates McDonald's and outperform. All right, Nick, let's start with it here. Uh, comp sales, at least the Bloomberg consensus for comp sales right now, I think is tracking just under 5%. What do you expect? I think they're going to be fine in terms of the comp in the U.S. Uh, you know, my worry is more about the, the IOM markets, Europe, Middle East. You know, we are seeing some boycotts impact uh, across the board restaurants, uh, uh, not just McDonald's, but U.S. brands uh, in those markets. Uh, so it does seem like there's going to be a little bit of a near term impact. But in the U.S., you know, they're still the market share gainer, uh, even in a more defensive consumer environment. I want to stay on the overall uh, seas markets for a moment because other chains have also warned of weakness. So how low is the bar for these overseas comp sales heading into the earnings report? I think it is well understood. So I do think investors will look past it. You know, the other part of this is the January weather is going to impact the U.S. comp in Q1 as well. I think investors understand that. And so I think they'll look past it as well. Uh, so those are the two things that are relatively well understood now. Is there a growth story here? I mean, when you consider sort of the pace of growth that we've had out of this company over the last few years, and of course with some of the CEO changes as well here, are we looking at maybe the potential for a reacceleration in that area? We are. Again, it's in the context of the size of McDonald's. So, you know, over the past decade, we've seen in the U.S. net closures. Now we're going to see net opening. It's not going to be, you know, gangbuster numbers, but it'll be potentially an acceleration towards one or two percent in the U.S. Uh, in, in the IOM markets, yes, we're going to continue to see some nice growth there because of the profitability and the returns on those units in Europe. All right, Nick. Uh, great to call, talk to you. Nick set you on over there. A nice uh, setup uh, on uh, some of the earnings we're going to get next week uh, out of McDonald's and a lot more going on uh, also next week as we set you up for what to watch over the next uh, few days. And that includes Jay Powell taking it to the people. Yes. An interview on 60 Minutes. He's going to be talking in the wake of a very, very strong jobs report and the decision by the Federal Reserve to basically signal that they're done raising interest rates and uh, hopes for a rate cut probably aren't going to materialize until later this year, not March. Yeah. And of course, after we get that Powell speech, we're actually going to have a lot of economic data to parse next week as well. I think that includes uh, some ISM, uh, the services numbers, actually. Which that's is going to be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the strongest yeah. part of the economy. It's the biggest part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. economy as well. And that's where inflation has proved to be a little stickier than in the goods part of the economy. Yeah, I do wonder, because the service has really been the ballast, right? Mm -hmm. and, and now you start to talk about this idea of if goods doesn't pick up and services starts to weaken. Yeah, uh, where, where do we, we stand? Uh, we're also going to have uh, some news, potential news in the world of politics here. The Supreme Court are uh, going to hear arguments here on, the, uh, on Donald Trump and all these uh, conversations about immunity and whether he should be on the ballot. Right. Although yeah. there will be primaries being held across yes. the U.S., uh, you'll be at one of them, right? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be there <laughs> as well as doing other things. And we're going to hear from the Treasury Secretary. Janet Yellen actually set to seek, speak before the Senate. And we get quite a few earnings, not just McDonald's, but some other ones as well. A lot of consumer companies, Spotify among them, Disney, kicking Oof, things off yeah. for the big media companies. There's also Uber. There's also Eli Lilly and Estee Lauder. So a yeah. real cross-section of the economy. Yeah, Lilly could be interesting. So could PayPal. Uh, please join us next week. We'll have full coverage of all those earnings, all that economic data, and so much more. This is Bloomberg.